Hello everyone. Welcome to the Classroom 2.0 Live show for Saturday the 13th of June. Today's topic is the Math Playground Games and Apps with our special guest Colleen King. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. I'm now going to turn over the mic to Maureen who will introduce Colleen. Great. Thanks, Lori. I'm really excited to have Colleen back on the show today. I first met Colleen on social media. I think the first time I met her in person was probably at EduBloggerCon East, which is now an ed camp, I think. But we were friends on Twitter and we were friends on Plurk, if anyone still remembers Plurk. I really got to know Colleen back in 2008 at the Constructing uh, Modern Knowledge Conference, the very first one, and I was totally overwhelmed by everything, and I learned firsthand what a kind, wonderful teacher Colleen King is, aside from being an amazing, brilliant woman. She showed Marie and me and I how to program the little rover robots. She helped me out every single time and there were many times when I ran into bugs in my programming, and she was a real lifesaver for this math phobe. Colleen created Math Playground in 2002 for students in her classes who needed a fun way to practice math facts. Since then, Math Playground has grown to include a wide variety of math topics from problem solving and mathematical art to real world math and thinking games. When she's not developing new activities for Math Playground, she teaches at a mathematics learning center. Colleen enjoys sharing math strategies with other educators and has presented her work at conferences like NCTM and ISTE. Whenever she has free time, she can be found playing with her beautiful golden retriever pups practicing drums with her band, or exploring New England on her bicycle. It's a true pleasure to welcome Colleen back to Classroom 2.0. And now we're going to move on to the newbie questions. Colleen, why are problem solving games so important? Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. And Maureen, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, it brought back a lot of nice memories. We, we had a good time at that workshop. Um, well, from a teaching perspective, uh, problem solving games are important because they help students develop skills that enhance the conceptual content and information they're, re they're acquiring. Um, spatial reasoning, computational thinking, and creative thinking are tools uh, that enable students to do something useful with their factual knowledge. Of course, there are many ways to introduce problem solving. There are hands-on projects and hands-on games and pencil and paper challenges. But online problem solving games have some unique advantages built right into their design. And we'll be discussing that today and also looking specifically at the relationship between problem solving games and mathematics. And um, since it's been almost two years uh, since the last time I was a guest on Classroom 2.0, I'll be sharing some updates about the site as well. So um, that's just my intro slide. OK. Uh, this slide gives you an overview of the kinds of activities you'll find on Math Playground. Uh, in addition to the math games, Math Playground has manipulatives, uh, video instruction, word problems, um, logic puzzles, some fact practice, and tons of problem solving activities. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to share some little known or uh, not as known facts about Math Playground. Um, Math Playground is actually starting its 14th year online. It's, uh, it's hard to believe, but it began as a very, very simple math practice site that I created for my students. Um, there couldn't have been more than four or five uh, activities on there for, uh, for the students to practice. And now millions of students around the world are visiting each month. So it's, it's grown incredibly. Um, 
Math Playground is designed and published by a math teacher. Um, I've been doing math with K-12 students for uh, about 20 years now, and I try to bring that experience to, to the activities I design in Math Playground. Um, math Playground has a, a partnership with Donors Choose. Um, I was introduced to that charity a few years ago and, and really liked what they were doing and, and began to uh, help fund some of the classroom projects. And, and uh, you know, two years ago when I was on the show, I, I had reported that 150 projects had been um, funded through Math Playground or well, with Math Playground's help, but it's grown to now 830 classroom projects. And I was amazed when I saw those numbers. And just in two years' time to go from 150 projects to, to 830 classroom projects. And, and in that time, I've learned that um, there's uh, quite a Donors Choose community of teachers um, very active on Facebook and, and all helping each other out to get their projects funded. So I've, I've gotten to know a lot of, a lot of the teachers there. And, and um, I'm, I'm fully committed to this charity. I think it's wonderful. Um, last time I was here, I mentioned that a book called Playing with Math was going to be published and that uh, Math Playground was going to be included in that book. And it's finally been published. Actually, uh, I think it was about two months ago. Um, and it's a compilation of, of math stories from educators who work with children in a variety of settings. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Um, that's a book you, you might be interested in, in reading. And, um, and the other important thing about Math Playground is that it's, um, it's a kid safe and COPA privacy certified site. Um, there are only 10 other websites for children that, that have that certification. So um, it's important to note that, that Math Playground really does strive to be a safe site for kids. So the big draw on Math Playground are the math games. And uh, here's a screenshot of, of just a, a sample of some of the games. Um, right now, I, I, there's more than 140 math games available. And last time I was here, I had reported 80. So I guess I've been busy. Um, so 60 new games uh, were developed. And um, these games are all aligned to the common core standards for mathematics. In fact, there's a common core section on Math Playground that, um, where you actually see this classification. And on, on every page that houses a game, you'll see the specific standard that that game targets. And it'll be listed below the game. Um, I mean, this is still a work in progress. There's a, there's a lot more that I need to, to map out in the Common Core section. But um, right now, the, the topics that we're covering are, um, it begins with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And then uh, we include money, time, fractions, decimals, ratios, proportions, percent, order of operations, a lot of geometry topics, um, and, and algebraic thinking. I like to think of the math games as uh, coming in six flavors. Um, and those flavors are fact practice, number puzzles, algebraic reasoning, geometric thinking, problem solving, and creative math. Um, so fact practice games are, I don't think of them as learning games. They, they're really there to reinforce math facts that, that students are already beginning to acquire. Um, you know, sometimes they're referred to drill games, but they're important. You know, um, students do need to have their facts down only because it makes um, more challenging math easier when you don't have to stop and, and wonder what, you know, six times seven is. You can, uh, if you have that instant recall, uh, you can get that out of the way and, and focus on the actual problem solving. So, so fact practice games do still have their place in the math curriculum. Um, number puzzles are, are games that involve manipulating numbers um, to reach some goal. Uh, knowing facts may be helpful, but they, they're probably not necessary. Um, it's more about reasoning about numbers. Um, algebraic reasoning games, uh, the ones here are, are all balancing type games. Um, and while fact fluency would make these games easier to play, the main goal is to have students interact with algebraic concepts like equality and, and, um, and also things like equal groups. 
Uh, geometric thinking games are, are um, they, these are games that ask students to consider various concepts related to shapes. So these games might deal with area and perimeter, angles, transformations. The problem solving games, um, now these are, these are mathematical problem solving games. They're, they're a little bit different from the uh, problem solving logic type games I'm going to be speaking about next. In these games, students encounter a series of puzzles based on math concepts. So for example, in the, the first picture, um, that game is called Gap Zappers. And students have to use fractional lengths of board to, to fill this gap. So there, there are gaps on the road, and, and this character is walking along. And in order to continue his journey, he has to, uh, these gaps need to be filled in so he doesn't fall through the hole. Um, so there are specific constraints at each level. So very early on, uh, students may be asked to fill a one meter gap with eight equal pieces. So what they have to choose, choose from, what's in their toolbox, are unit fractions. So there's, uh, there's one fourth, one half, one third, one fifth, one sixth, all the way up to one twelfth. And for this particular challenge, they realize that they need eighths. Later, they'll have to fill in a two meter gap also with eight equal pieces. Now, because they still need eight pieces, but the gap is twice as long, they have to make the connection that their fraction pieces have to be twice as large. So instead of eighths, they're going to need fourths. Further on, they'll need to fill the one meter gap with only one board, but all they have are fractional pieces. So at that point, they're introduced to a tool that combines unit fractions into larger ones. So now they're adding fractions. And then even later than that, they'll find that their boards are too long, and they'll have to make them smaller. And that requires subtracting fractional parts. Um, in, in the second picture, um, that's called design a party. And students have to set up a room for a party based on area and perimeter clues. So they can actually move um, these images around the board and create uh, actually use the background of tiles to help them figure out the actual area and perimeter. And the final picture in the problem solving row is um, it's a picture of a game called Scale Factor X. And this is for older students, um, grade six and up. Students are immersed in a world of ratio and proportion. In the first scenario, students manipulate objects to create the proper ratios. Then later, they, they have to scale various components up or down and follow a blueprint to build a tool that they need. And in the final challenge, students are asked to use proportions and scale to interpret a map. And the final flavor is creative math. And uh, these games provide students with an opportunity to actually create things using mathematical concepts. Um, in equation creation, students make designs, beautiful designs, and control animations through nothing more than mathematical equations. That's all they're using. Everything that happens in, in this uh, game is, is, is through math equations. Now, this particular game, Equation Creations, is also an app. So you can find this in, in the iTunes store. Um, next to that, we have a very simple logo programming tool that students can use to draw pictures through a series of, of mathematical commands. Um, and Pattern Blocks uh, is, is a tool for exploring patterns and, and shape attributes. Um, students can build on screen and uncover many mathematical ideas. I should, I should really be looking at the chat. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not even looking at the chat. Um, Maureen asks, do you come up with an idea for a game and then add the math practice? Or do you create the game to help learn or practice a math concept? Oh, that's a great question. I actually begin with the math concept. And then I ask myself, what's fun about this? What's fun about this concept? And, and maybe I'll play with that concept myself, you know, just on paper and sketching out ideas. And I'll get a sense of, of what's enjoyable about, about this particular idea. And then I, I try to build the game around that. So in addition to math games, we have another whole section um, that I call thinking games. 
and and these these encompass a variety of topics, uh, mostly logic puzzles, some strategy games. Um, these games teach spatial reasoning, problem solving, computational thinking. And uh, I, I feel that these skills are, are an important part of a, of a well-rounded math education. Now, these games are also aligned to the common core, but the focus is more on the, the, the standards for mathematical practice. Um, so for example, uh, Math Practice 1 states that students um, that show mathematical proficiency must or they actually make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. They plan a solution pathway rather than simply jumping into uh, a solution attempt. And they evaluate their progress and change course if necessary. And this is exactly what students are doing when they play these types of games. Um, also, uh, we cover Math Practice 7, uh, looking for and making use of structure, and Math Practice 8, which is uh, looking for um, repeated reasoning and, and patterning. I'm going to speak in, in much greater depth about um, the thinking games. So in general, computer-based games that involve reasoning and thought, as opposed to like quick reflexes and mindless action, contain an astonishing number of opportunities to engage students in processes we typically connect with mathematical thinking. Uh, these are games that contain little, if, if any, math in the obvious way. There are no numbers and, and no numerical operators. Yet, if you were to really watch students play these games, you would see so many parallels to the learning that happens when students work through math problems in the classroom. So at the center of the mathematical processes that um, are modeled in these thinking games is problem solving. And that's the obvious one. In every thinking game on Math Playground, there are problems to solve. These problems come in many forms, but all have some common features. There is always something that needs to be resolved. Uh, you have to find a solution. Uh, there may be obstacles along the way. And after you work it out, reach your goal, a slightly more difficult problem awaits, and you start the process all over again. Now, these fun, colorful games with monsters and aliens and mesmerizing soundtracks do more than provide interesting challenges. And sometimes it, it, it can be easy to miss this point. But these games actually provide students with opportunities to apply logical thought, exercise spatial reasoning skills, plan, and strategize. While exploring the game environment, students are analyzing cause and effect situations all the time and applying trial and error strategies. They're collecting data and making decisions instantaneously on that data. And sometimes, you know, there are games that even ask them to reason about numbers. In using these games, they are doing exactly what mathematicians do when faced with a new problem to solve. Well, let's take a closer look at mathematical problem solving. Um, there's a famous mathematician named George Polya who came up with a four-step problem solving strategy that can be applied to just about any problem, and not necessarily a math problem. I mean, these, these are so general that, that they can be applied to any problem. Um, the steps will seem very simplistic and obvious, but if students apply them consistently, their problem skills will most definitely improve. So the first step is understand the problem. So before you ever hope to solve a math problem, you have to be really clear about what you're being asked to do. Um, being able to restate the problem in your own words is one way to show that understanding. Maybe drawing a picture could be helpful. There's other ways. You can ask questions to clarify. But after, after you, you do all those things, draw the picture, ask the questions, you should have a really clear understanding of, of what it is you're trying to solve. Your next step is to devise a plan. You think about potential strategies. Uh, most of us have developed a toolbox of strategies. Um, you might look for a pattern or work backwards or try to solve a simpler problem. Maybe write an equation, make a list. Just choose one and then move on to the third step, carry out the plan. Give it a try. If it works, great. You solve the problem. If it didn't work, 
to try another strategy. Uh, keep, keep at it. Be persistent. You'll eventually solve it. When you solved it, you look back on the work you've just done and what strategy worked, what didn't work. And this will be useful when a similar problem is encountered in the future. So let's apply Polya's four steps to a math problem. Um, so Abigail works at Happy Holidays. She is filling glass jars with red, green, and white candies according to a set of rules. Exactly one-fourth of the candies must be red. 30 candies must be green. And there must be twice as many red candies as white candies. The question is how many pieces of candy are in each glass jar? So what do we want to do first? Well, we want to understand the problem. Now, the question is pretty easy. Uh, it's easy to understand. How many, they want to know how many pieces of candy are in, are in the glass jar, in each glass jar. But what about that information that we've been given? Do we understand that? I mean, that's a little confusing. You know, one fourth of the candies have to be red, but there's twice as many red candies as white. And I don't even know how many white candies there are. They say nothing about that. And all 30 candies must be green. See, that's the key to this problem, is understanding that middle section. Um, the question is pretty clear and straightforward, but that middle section could be a little confusing. So now that, um, now that we're starting to understand what we have to focus on is these relationships between the quantities of the candies, we need to devise a plan. What's, what's the best way to solve this problem? Um, is this a working backwards problem? I don't think so, because we really don't have an endpoint. Um, it's not really a patterning problem, and I'm not sure making a list would be helpful, but I can almost visualize this problem. So I'm thinking drawing a picture might be the way to proceed. And somebody said that. Who's that? Peggy, draw a picture. Um, so, uh, but then again, Peggy saw my slide, so uh, <laughs> she might have skipped ahead and, and already saw that. Um, so we go to the next slide, and whoops, we see that uh, drawing a picture is, is, is a pretty useful way to do it. Now, why didn't I draw four boxes? Because the first piece of information was told me that one-fourth of the candies must be red. Well, I could have, except that when I get down to the third piece of information, that there are twice as many red candies at white can as white candies, well, that means I have half as many white candies as red candies. And if I use only four boxes, I'm going to have to split a box. So I may as well just start with eight anyway. So I created eight boxes, showed that one-fourth of those boxes are red. And that's designated with the letter R. And um, that would be two out of the eight boxes. I know there's twice as many red candies as white candies. So if two boxes denote the red candies, then one box should uh, model the number of white candies. And so everything that's left over must be all the green candies, and we know that's 30. Well, from there, we can carry out this plan and actually solve the problem. We now have a relationship we can use. Five boxes have a value of 30. So each box has a value of 6. All eight boxes together is 8 times 6 is 48. So there are 48 pieces of candy in each glass jar. So that's, that's um, how Paul used four steps to problem solving works with, with a typical math problem. Now let's see what happens when we have a thinking game. Oops, hold on. I wanted to skip this problem. Um, what happens when we have a thinking game? So what I have here are the first two levels of a game called Sugar, Sugar 2. So the first step, understand the problem. What do we have to do here? Well, it looks like we have sugar pouring onto the game field, and there's a cup. We probably have to steer that sugar toward the cup and collect it. There's a number on the cup. That number is probably going to change as it collects sugar. So understanding the problem, we need to guide that sugar into the cup. Let's devise a plan. How are we going to do that? Well, it turns out we can draw right on this game. So, um, so it looks like we're going to be drawing a path. But 
what kind of path would, should we draw? Should, should it be a, a steep incline? Can it be more of a, a horizontal line? Uh, that's where trial and error is going to come into play for us. Um, so we carry out this plan. We, we draw the path, and, and we'll make those adjustments if needed um, until we get the sugar into the cup. And then after we've completed this level, we can now think about how we solve that problem because more than likely, this is going to come up again in another level and perhaps in a, in a more difficult challenge. And in fact, if you look at level two, we have the sugar pouring onto the game field again. And there's, there's not only one cup, but there are two cups. And one of the cups is nowhere near that stream of sugar. So now we've encountered a, um, a slightly more difficult problem. So we're going to apply what we figured out in the first level so that we can solve the problem we're faced in level two. Now, one problem solving strategy that is used a lot in, in mathematics is called solving a simpler problem. And notice how that strategy is actually built right into the game. I mean, the strategy is, is part of the game's design. So mathematical problem solving steps naturally arise in the context of this thinking game. Okay, now we're a little further along in the game, and I'm showing you a picture of level three, and then also um, down below a picture of level eight. So we see this kind of thinking process played out again and again in games like Sugar Sugar 2. So let's move on to level three, and we're going to compare it with level eight. First thing, understand the problem. Okay, we know we have to direct the sugar into the cups, but wait a minute. Uh, we have a red cup, and there's some weird looking red tool there. Uh, looks like some of this sugar has to be red before it can enter the red cup. So that's a little more difficult challenge. Let's devise a plan. What strategy will we use? Um, well, we've never had to change the color of the sugar, so there's going to be a lot of experimenting this time. And again, trial and error. So we carry out the plan. We draw the path, make our adjustments until we get it to work. and then. We look back. We think about how we solved this problem because more than likely this is going to come up again in, in another more difficult level. Now think about this. Many of these thinking games have 30 or more levels. Students playing these games are carrying out Paulia's four-step problem solving plan an astounding number of times. You'd never be able to solve enough math problems to match this quantity of practice. So, these thinking games really do have a place in, in children's education. So we've seen how fundamental problem solving steps are designed into these thinking games. But there's so much more. I spent several months playing and, and really focusing on Math Playground's thinking games and doing so from an educational and analytical perspective. And I was amazed by the amount of cognitive engagement that takes place as you progress through the levels. And there are two different types of reasoning that kept appearing over and over again. And that's computational thinking and spatial reasoning. And we're going to take a closer look at each of these processes. Now, computational thinking is actually, um, it actually encompasses a number of skills. Um, that are typically used by software engineers to write computer programs. But these skills are far more important than that. Um, the four main processes are uh, decomposition, decomposing problems, pattern recognition, abstraction, and algorithm design. Now, decomposition is breaking a task or problem into many simpler steps. And this requires the ability to analyze the problem. I mean, you can't break a problem down into simple steps unless you understand the problem thoroughly. In math, for example, to find the area of a complex figure, you need to first break the figure into manageable parts, rectangles and triangles, etc. And then you find the area of the individual pieces. Now, pattern rec recognition, um, this is the ability to notice similarities or even common differences that help you to make predictions or lead to shortcuts. Um, sometimes 
we see this often when, when we have some data that we're trying to make sense of and maybe we organize it into a, a function table to see if there's a linear connection. And, and when we determine that, we can, um, we can write an equation that connects the data and then apply it to, uh, to other problems. Abstraction is filtering out the extra unnecessary information and generalizing patterns. Now this leads to, to models and, and simulations. And in algorithm design, that's developing a step-by-step -step strategy to solve the problem. So it's a form of sequential reasoning. In math, an example would be the long division algorithm that we all love so much. And spatial reasoning. Spatial reasoning involves the movement of objects and, and even ourselves, either mentally or physically, through space. It encompasses several different concepts and processes. Thinking games emphasize uh, spatial visualization, and that's spatial reasoning done mentally or in your mind's eye. So we have uh, composing shapes, and this is your ability to visualize how two or more individual shapes can be combined into a new figure. And the opposite of that is decomposing shapes, which we touched on in computational thinking. Manipulating objects. This is your ability to move an object through space, like folding a 2D net into a 3D object. And more complicated maneuvers involving reflecting and rotating objects and scaling up or down. Navigation, in the context of games, this would relate to your ability to move about the game world, left, right, forward, back, up, down. Map reading would be an abstract example. Understanding visual data, pie charts, bar graphs. And locating objects um, in games that involve exploration, uncovering objects to use in future activities is, is often a main game mechanic. And remembering locations is, is the game mechanic in concentration type matching puzzles. And beyond the two main uh, types of reasoning, computational and spatial, there's, there's a wealth of, of other skills. There's, I, I'm not going to go into detail because I, I just <laughs> realized the time. Um, this is going very quickly. Um, but there are, there are problem-solving strategies embedded in the games. We just saw that in, in, um, in Sugar Sugar. There's opportunities for creative thinking, exploring, experimenting, cause and effect, testing ideas, geometric thinking, deductive reasoning. So not only are Math Playground's thinking games rich with problem-solving activi activity, but some also see, seem to act as mathematical models. For example, this is a picture of Factory Balls 2, and it relies on sequential reasoning. And the goal is to transform the plain white ball uh, on, on the bottom left to, um, to the more colorful and interesting ball that you see on the box. And you're given a set of tools to accomplish this. There are things like paint and hats and, and some far less conventional tools. Well, order is everything, though. There's a specific series of actions you must take to convert the ball. And kids love this game. I, I've watched my own students spend 20, 30 minutes just trying to find the right sequence of steps. But this game mechanic in factory balls reminds me of mathematical problem solving. Think orders of operations, simplifying algebraic expressions, transformations. These all involve a sequential reasoning of mathematical steps. So the question I always pose to myself is, is how do I get students as excited about sequential reasoning and mathematics as they are when they're playing games like Factory Balls? Another example of underlying math connections is in um, the Tower of Hanoi puzzle game. Um, the key to solving more challenging levels of this tower puzzle is recognizing there's a pattern and then applying it to a greater number of disks. What are the fewest moves possible with one ring, two rings, three rings? The nice thing about this game is that you can actually set up the experiment. Uh, if you have one ring, it only takes one move. Two rings takes three moves. Three rings takes seven moves. And four rings takes 15 moves. And I, I meant to put that in the slide. I, I'm sorry for that. Um, but what we are starting to create is an in and out chart or a function table. and and what do we have to do with, with the number of rings to get the number of moves? And it turns out that there's constantly a doubling of the number of moves. So that implies that, that we're going to have a relationship that involves raising two to some power. And sure enough, the, the connection is 
um, we take the number of rings, use that as the exponent of two. So when there's two rings, we're going to take two to the second power and subtract one. That gives us three moves. So for two rings, it's going to take three moves to solve this puzzle. So you can pose a problem to your students. Imagine the tower has 30 rings and that must be relocated to tower C. What's the fewest number of moves needed to accomplish this task? Turns out that it's an enormous number of moves. But that's something fun for them to explore and see how far they can get than doing it actually in the puzzle game. So the, the educational value of math playgrounds thinking games uh, is, is obviously extensive. But um, few people really make the connection because at first glance, these games seem more like entertainment. So I needed a, uh, to find a way to, to make the educational value of these games known to teachers and parents. And it's important to note that the selection of games on Math Playground are there because each one fits the problem solving criteria we just discussed. Games for kids are abundant online, but not all games have educational value. You have to be very selective. The Math Playground thinking games needed to be highlighted and set apart from all these other games that, that don't have substantial value at all. So that's where my friend and renowned educator Bob Sprankel comes in. Bob listened to my dilemma and he saw the solution immediately. Uh, he thought Math Playground's games needed video introductions. So not only would we draw attention to the educational value and answer the why play this game question, but we could also address other, another pressing question. Um, how do we play this game? And which is something I really hadn't addressed very well on the site. So Bob had the brilliant idea of demonstrating the games in two ways. He, he would play them correctly and then also make mistakes. And in the video, he manages to appeal to uh, adults and children. And in addition to demonstrating the components of the game, Bob suggests strategies, introduces vocabulary words, and, and models the actual gameplay. So here's an example of a video introduction for the game Humble Jungle Puzzle. Uh, so the video begins with a brief overview of the key skills students encounter while playing the game. And these are written as bullet points with, without explanation. Just wanted to make the point to people that there's educational value in this game. Then from there, Bob goes right into the game and explains the game environment. He sets up the storyline and the action and points out tools and buttons. Um, then he begins to play the game. He'll make mistakes that students are likely to make and then shows how to play correctly. Bob usually dem demonstrates three or four levels, enabling students to approach the remaining levels with much more confidence. And the video ends with a summary of the educational value of the game in, in much greater depth and highlights some of the key features uh, in this game planning paths and step-by-step -step reasoning is, is a big part of, of the gameplay. Um, so we've completed 120 educational support videos so far and hope to do another 80 or so. And they'll be published this summer in time for the, for the new school year. So if you plan to use uh, thinking games with your students on Math Playground, please show the videos to your students. And, and you should use them yourself to get an idea of what's happening in the game and how you can um, integrate it into your, into your classroom setting. Uh, any questions? That's my uh, section on thinking games. And now I'm just going to move on to uh, some updates about the site. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll answer them here. But go ahead. OK. So OK, last time I was here, I talked about thinking blocks, which is a set of online interactive tools for visualizing and solving math word problems. Um, so you can probably figure out what kinds of questions are being asked just from the way the models look. For example, uh, the top left, that's a comparison problem. Uh, we're looking for the difference between two quantities. But of course, the problem could be worded to solve for any one of the three quantities in the problem. The model works for all three. The next one is a combining. The one next one is a combining problem to make a whole. On the bottom left, we have a multiplicative relationship. There's, well, there's one quantity, but there's another quantity that's four times the size of the other one. And we're looking for the difference. And the last model shows two quantities in, in a ratio, two to three. And we're asked to find the total. And Thinking Blocks is a set of tutorials, um, interactive tutorials. They're, they're, they're more than just tutorials, really, that guide students through the um, the modeling process and, and the problem solving steps. And, and it covers addition, multiplication, fractions, and ratios. That's, that's just a little background 
for those who are unfamiliar with Thinking Blocks. Now, Thinking Blocks has been online since 2004, but I had just launched the iPad apps back in 2013, and they, they've been actually free all this time. So it says current price free. I, I never did put a price on them. As a result of not putting a, a price, I, I believe, um, they've been downloaded an astounding number of times. Get ready. 2.5 million downloads of thinking blocks. I couldn't believe it. I, I just discovered that this week. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's truly unbelievable. But it's wonderful, because that means there are 2.5 million kids learning to model and solve word problems. That's wonderful, really wonderful. Um, Picking Blocks also has a, um, a modeling tool that can be used online. I don't have an app for this yet. That's in the works, though. But you can actually use this to um, model your own word problems. And you can do some group work with your students at, at the whiteboard. Or students can even work independently, because there are problems built into the tool. So when students check their work, they'll see the correct model based on the numbers in their problem. These, these, the answers are generated dynamically, and the models are generated dynamically. So you're not going to see a generic model. You'll see the actual model kids should be making. So the most recent addition to Thinking Blocks suite of tools is called Thinking Blocks Junior. Now students in grades one and two can model addition and subtraction problems. And there are five models to practice that include single and multi-step types of problems. And the number ranges um, are much smaller. They, they can choose to work with numbers from one to 10 or numbers from one to 20. Now this is currently only available online, but I do hope to make an app of this. Another thing I wanted to tell you about is, is that Math Playground has a a mobile section that has been optimized for all devices, iPads, iPhones, Androids, tablets, tablets, Kindles. Um, there are now about 75 games available. Um, and I'll be adding a new game like practically every week throughout the summer. And the game categories are, I have a math game section, a thinking game section, and then there are a few fun games. And almost all of the games in the mobile section are also available on the desktop version if, if you prefer to use that. Um, but um, it would be great to get the word out about the, the mobile math playground because um, it, it's functioning so well. It took me forever to make, and I'm really proud of, of the final result there. I also wanted to um, let you know about a summer program I'm running this year. Um, so we'll be running a summer program for eight weeks from June 22nd, which is next Monday, through August 16th. Um, each week, we'll present a set of math practice games and a set of problem solving games. And each set will focus on a particular theme. So for example, we'll start the math off with addition and subtraction. And the problem solving games that week will focus on sequential reasoning, step by step. The, week for math, the math for week two is, is multiplication and division. The problem solving games will involve an adventure of some sort, uh, underwater, outer space, and so on. There's number of puzzles, fractions, two units of fractions, there's money, geometry, word problems. Um, and in addition to the games, there will also be math challenges for the kids to try, actual you know, pen and pencil type stuff. And um, we'll post solutions the following week. Now, it's really simple to get involved. Um, it's free. There are no sign-ups, logins, or passwords, none of that. You just go to mathplayground.com, summermath.html. You'll see a calendar like this one I have here set up for June. The calendar isn't active yet, because the programs begin next Monday. But when it becomes June 22nd, you would just click on the Let's Get Started button, and um, you'll see what we have set up for the first week. And uh, once a week has become active, it remains active for the rest of the summer. So while future topics remain locked, and, and they only get unlocked when, when their week uh, comes up, the other topics will always be available. You can always go back and play the games again. So Bob and I saw this as, as, a, as a fun, no-stress way for kids to stay connected with mathematical thinking throughout the summer. Uh, so the book I mentioned earlier, and in my last talk, has finally been published, and it was a really long time coming. Um, Playing with Math is an anthology of really interesting stories 
about the various ways people are teaching math now in a variety of settings. You'll read accounts by K-12 teachers, homeschooling parents, math circle leaders, math bloggers, and, and many, many others. The common thread is that all these educators are showing kids the fun and intriguing side of math. So uh, the book was put together by Sue Van Haddam, and she's a college professor out in California and a, and a blogger. And uh, she's the editor of the book. And it was a monumental task. It took years and years and years, and it just kept growing. And, and now it's, uh, it's in its final form, and, and there are a lot of wonderful stories. Now, I, I authored two chapters in the book. One describes some of my teaching adventures that, um, that take place at the math center that my husband and I work at. And um, the other chapter describes how Math Playground came to be. It discusses the ways in which my students actually influenced the design of, of Math Playground. So the book is, is well worth reading, not so much for my contributions, but, but for what the other authors have shared. Uh, there are great problems to ponder and terrific ideas for teaching math at all levels. Um, there's a very vibrant uh, and engaging community of math educators online, and many of them are included in this book. And uh, if you go to the site, I, I believe there's an ebook version you can download and start reading right away. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about internet safety because this is a really big issue um, out in the world and, and it's kind of near and dear to me. Um, so I mentioned that Math Playground is a kids safe COPA privacy certified site. As you know, there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of sites that appear to be designed for children. You know, they have games and, and things and, and cartoonish characters, but only 11 sites are kids safe COPA certified, and Math Playground is one of them. It's a lengthy process, and the rules are very, very strict, but I felt it was important to have Math Playground, to have math playground designated a safe site for kids. And there are other ways I keep, try to keep kids safe. I never embed games on, from other sites onto Math Playground. Uh, one reason is that these embedded games almost always have ads running in front of the games that publishers cannot control. Anything could be shown, and you can't do anything about it. The other reason is that embedded games lead kids back to the gaming portals that, from which the games originated. Um, these portals are not at all safe for kids. Really, they should be classified as adult sites. Um, publishers use these games because they are free, but they are, in fact, placing kids in unsafe situations. Instead, Math Playground pays a licensing fee to developers for the use of their games. In exchange, the games have absolutely no ads embedded and no outgoing links. Um, so I think it's a much better experience overall for, for students. Now, Math Playground is ad supported. There's just no way around that. It, it's very expensive to run a children's site properly. Um, however, I personally review and monitor the ads daily. To be honest, actually hourly. I, sometimes I just sit there and monitor ads. I, I'm very conscious of the ads that are running on Math Playground, almost too much. Um, but I also limit the number of ads shown on Math Playground. Um, I received a, a wonderful email from a teacher asking if I would put uh, certain games on Math Playground. Uh, he and his students had been playing it on another site, but he noticed that the I don't know, that the site had become very commercialized and, and the ads were no longer appropriate. So he, had, so he realized how safe Math Playground was, and he asked if I would get those games so that, that, so that his students could come play on Math Playground in a safe place. That warmed my heart. You know, that, that was just the greatest email. But anyway, I went over and visited that site, and my goodness, I, I found seven ads running on its home page, and every single ad was an underwear ad. So he had a point, you know. Um, so now hopefully he and his students are playing at Math Playground, and it's much safer for the kids. Uh, the other thing to note is Math Playground has absolutely no links at all to any social sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, <clears throat> it's just best to uh, not have an easy way for kids to get to those sites. Um, you never know what you're going to see. And that's another problem with embedded games. A lot of those games lead kids directly to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So there are a lot of sites offering math and thinking games, but at Math Playground, you have my word that your students will always be safe there. And in conclusion, I'd like to share some hopes and dreams. Um, I would love to extend the mobile site to include learning tools in addition to games. 
Um, so things like almost like little mathematical gadgets that kids can interact with. I want to develop more games uh, that teach concepts visually, much like the fraction game I explained earlier uh, with filling the gap with the fraction pieces. I think games like that are important to have. Um, I, I get asked all the time to translate thinking blocks to other languages. I, I need to do that. Um, there are a lot of non-English speaking students who are eager to use thinking blocks. Um, I want to build collaborative math activities and I'd love to integrate communication and assessment tools. But I call these hopes and dreams because Math Playground is really only one person. <laughs> it's just me and I pretty much do everything on the site so it can be difficult for me to get to do all that I, I really want to accomplish but uh, these are on my bucket list for sure. And um, if you ever want to get in touch with me <coughs> or, or connect with Math Playground, I uh, have the address for the website. I have a, I have a Facebook page um, that I need to post to more frequently and engage with uh, people who are there. Uh, my Twitter account is at Math Playground. Uh, there was an earlier slide that showed an underscore between math and playground, but it's really just all one word. Um, we have a Pinterest account. Um, we're starting to collect uh, math games and things there from the site and, and trying to unify, unify them there. And um, we have several iPad apps in addition to the Thinking Blocks apps that are on iTunes. And you can find those by just searching for Math Playground uh, the, as the developer. So thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning, afternoon, or evening with me. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to find questions. <laughs> no wonder you didn't have time to come to Ed Camp Boston. Yeah, no kidding. Sometimes I feel like I, I work uh, a 20 hour day. I did capture some of the questions, Colleen. Um, oh, okay. are, you, are you still doing all the graphics and programming aside from creating the games? Um, a lot, I would say. Uh, Maybe 50-50. Um, I, mm -hmm. I try to do as much of the artwork as I can, but I, I really don't have great art skills. So um, that's the one nice thing about creating more simple games is that you can kind of get by with these shape-based artwork and stuff, mm -hmm. and that's a lot easier to create. So I try to do as much of that as I can, but um, sometimes I need to to turn to other sources. Mm -hmm. Uh, are the mathematical processes sequential, or do they happen in a random order? I'm not sure if that oh, one's that's a great specific question. game or, or, they should, or what. They should happen and more randomly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these are things that should all go. Actually, should be going on simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so no, it's definitely not sequential. Uh, I've got a scroll up to get to where I left off. Um, are you using different ways of solving that align with different learning styles? I think you mentioned more visual, uh, visual, kinesthetic, et cetera. Yeah, um, definitely visual. Um, hands on to the extent that you're manipulating on screen items. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not tactile, but right. um, yeah, I, I'm definitely doing my best to, to head over in a, in a more visual direction, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. I think, in fact, from this point forward, anything I, I do create will, will be almost, I'm, I'm actually, my goal is to, is to remove the words altogether, if I can, mm -hmm. from, um, from a lot of these concept type games, just so that the, the, the pictures almost tell the story. Right. Um. What's the role of collaboration in math learning? Do kids learn more, faster, et cetera, by collaborating? Oh, I, I would say definitely, most definitely. I think, I think math is not a solitary sport. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's got to be done um, with at least one other person, and <clears throat> even better if you had you know small groups of four or five students, um, because 
people are always able to point things out or, or they have ideas that you just mm -hmm. need to think about or and they help you to see things differently and or they might challenge you. You might, you know, uh, see something in a math problem that maybe isn't quite right and someone will challenge that interpretation or so yeah, always, always collaborative. That's why I want to kind of move in the direction of collaborative tools. But those, those are tricky to to make. But um, I would love to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. How do you help kids learn to recognize patterns? Hmm. Um, gosh, I, I guess I would just start with, with very simple, almost obvious patterns, not with numbers, but maybe with, with shapes and objects mm -hmm. and, and work with attributes first and then, um, and then make those increasingly more difficult. And then once the student had a grasp on that, they could move to looking for patterns among numbers. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of leading with things like that. You know, I ask a, I ask a lot of questions uh -huh. when doing that kind of work with students. Does spatial reasoning come with practice if, if a student has not so good spatial reasoning to start when they play the games? Does that develop Absolutely. as they practice? Oh yeah, you're not born with a finite amount of spatial reasoning ability. Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely increase that. With, with these kinds of exercises, you know, these, these types of games, absolutely. Are there different oh, gosh, age I remember, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Uh, do the students compete with other students during the summer program? Um, they can. There, I do have a section of games on the site that, that allow for multiplayer action, mm -hmm. and some of those will be included in the summer games. So mm -hmm. they could definitely set up even private games and play against their friends if they want, and just invite their friends to play. Mm -hmm. Any advice from where to start if you want kids to do some math games or app creation? This was actually asked twice. Two different um, people could you, asked. Could you repeat the question? Well, any advice for where to start if you want kids to do some math game creation or app creation? Oh, oh, to create their own games. Right, and to create their own. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I would get them started with like the really simple tools that are mm -hmm. out there, the visual programming environments, like, like Scratch, I guess, is the yeah. best known one. And um, they, they could even begin by looking at what other kids have created on the Scratch site and, and see how they're making their games because you actually can can download games that kids have made and right. take it apart, just assemble it and see how it how it was built. And then from there that should hopefully um, spur some creativity on and and um, and then as they learn more programming skills they can they can start to develop better games. And and then from there, um, once they, they understand something like the Scratch environment, there are visual App development tools, and I, I can't recall the name. Of it. I don't. I don't personally work with them, but mm -hmm. I know that there are visual app creation tools, and so that would be like a logical next step after mm -hmm. that. Um, and then there are lots of there are there are just tons of, of game making programs, uh, but you'll mm -hmm. you'll need to know a little. Most of them are point and click, but they you can make much better games if you have some uh, some skill in JavaScript or you know some different programming languages. But yeah, Scratch, I would say, and then other visual development tools. Yeah, one person actually mentioned Scratch. And I've, I've had students work with Scratch, too. Yeah. Um, how important are the sounds or audio to the games? Oh, what a great question. Um, wow. This came up um, initially when, when I first started to make mobile games. It was very difficult to put sound into the games because um, not all devices would, 
would understand how to play the sound. Mm -hmm. So it was better just to leave sound out so that you didn't have these conflicts. Mm -hmm. And that was so painful for me to do because I had become very reliant on sound. Sure. I think, yeah, I mean, sounds are, are, I think they're very important. Maybe not the musical soundtracks from the back, but the, mm -hmm. the sounds of, at various points, like to, to get your attention or to, to let you know you're on the right track or, oh, no, maybe you're walking down the wrong path here. Sounds that are used in that way are, are essential, I think. Sure. Sure. I think those were the questions I was able to snag. Those are great questions. Yeah. Great. Unless there are people that know of visual app development tools. Oh, any plans to have a teacher portal like uh, Magna High or places like that? Oh, so where like um, students could log in and you can actually see um, how kids are doing with their progress. Um, like within a class or so, maybe? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not opposed to that. I, I, it is something I, I would like to see happen. It, um, I guess I need to do a better job of, of finding people to collaborate with mm -hmm. because, you know, I, like I personally can't do all these things myself. Mm -hmm. But, um, but if, I, if I could find a developer who, who would help with that, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would like to see that, definitely. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Thoughtful questions, and, and I really, again, appreciate you spending us time on your Saturday here with me. All right, we'll conclude. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Colleen. I am so inspired now to get in there myself and start playing some of these games. But you have just created wonderful things for us, and we are so appreciative. Want to let all of you know that we only have one more show before our summer break, and it also is going to be a math show. So come back next Saturday and learn all about the 10 Marks math program. And then remember, we'll be taking the month of July off and we'll be back August 1st. So that's a perfect time to go back and watch some of the recordings for the various shows you've missed. And I know that many of you don't have the opportunity to attend the ISTE conference um, in Philadelphia this year, but I wanted to let you know that there are some opportunities to get um, free access and also some paid access to things going on at ISTE. So be sure to check out these links and um, explore some of the things that are available um, for you at ISTE. This particular link gives you four ways to attend ISTE virtually. So check those out. Follow the hashtag not at ISTE, and you'll find lots of people tweeting about it and capturing resources to share with those of you who aren't able to go. And for those of you who can go, I really look forward to seeing you there. And so now I'm going to turn it back to Lori to quickly wrap us up and take us out. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered together all of his PD resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar. You can sign up to host a meeting in a Collaborate Room for free as long as you make the session public so anybody can attend it. You can also nominate a featured teacher. Uh, each month we have a featured teacher for the month. And there's a form at this URL, but you can also nominate yourself for that. As you exit the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. Here's the survey link. Peggy's also going to place the survey link in the chat box. It's also in the Live Binder. It's in that Resources tab at the end. Once you complete the survey and get to the bottom, you'll find fields to request the Professional Development Certificate. The name you enter in the name block prints on the certificate now. And please use a personal email address to receive it. 
because schools tend to block this. You won't get it normally if you request it with your school email address. There's also a survey. Well, here's the other. Here's another link for the survey um, to get the professional development certificate. The video collection and audio collection both are available in iTunes U. Uh, recordings are also available via an RSS feed as well as the full recordings in the website. Special thanks again to Colleen King, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the, our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming.